Um, few announcements. Uh, first of all, um, Lois is uh, away um, in the wilderness today. Um, she is, if you know anything about the New Testament, you know that's a motif for where God and God's people struggle and, uh, you know, and make uh, huge decisions. So Lois and the youth are away uh, in the wilderness of Wisconsin, Wisconsin Dells uh, this weekend, and let's hope that uh, great things uh, and miracles come out of that. So uh, John Coughlin is uh, filling in as our liturgist today, and we're glad that he can do that. Uh, a few things to remind you of, believe it or not, three weeks from today is the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Uh, and so, uh, as usual, we will be joining with uh, many other uh, churches and faith communities here in the Elgin area for an interfaith uh, Thanksgiving service. This year, it will be at the synagogue, the Congregation of Memphis Israel, uh, which is uh, back here, I think, on Division. Uh, and uh, so, uh, make plans to be there that night. It's at 7 o'clock. We'll have lots of music, and it'll be a great time to be together uh, with all of your brothers and sisters uh, in faith. Two weeks after that, one month from today, is the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, and uh, we will be, as in the past, we will be having an Advent Vesper service that evening. It's the beautiful music of the season. So we hope you'll come out for that. An added uh, treat is that this year's Advent Vesper service is going to be a hanging of the greens service. So we will be doing some decorating here in the sanctuary as a part of that service. So we will, this is family friendly. We want you to bring uh, the kids and uh, everybody will hear some great music and everybody can join in uh, putting up uh, some of the decorations here in the sanctuary. It's one month from today, December the 2nd. Um, the, uh, our food pantry, the Interfaith Food Pantry downstairs, is in need of some uh, bags, some plastic bags, uh, for the folks that come in to get food to uh, take those, that food away. So if you have some that you can donate, you can bring them and just put them downstairs uh, by the entrance of the food pantry, and they would appreciate that. Also, uh, I hope that you will take notice as you leave today and go out this door, look straight ahead of you, You'll see that that area out there is much brighter than it has been for a long time. That's because our brand new stained glass window got installed uh, this past this past week. So take a look at it as you leave. We'll be doing the dedication uh, for it in a couple of weeks, but uh, we weren't exactly sure what it was going to get here. But it got installed on Thursday, and it really looks great. So we hope you'll pay attention to that. Are there other announcements that need to be made this morning? Yes. Good morning, everybody. Hey, I wanted to point out uh, there was an article in this month's uh, church light uh, regarding a special collection uh, after the November 18th survey, uh, service for a U46 program called Project Access. And uh, Project Access is designed to help ensure uh, equal educational access for the 750 homeless students that uh, go to U46 schools. Uh, money collected would be used to cover a lot of out-of-pocket costs that families would typically supply for their children, uh, transportation, medical care, school supplies, activity fees, that type of thing. Um, the needs are great and growing rapidly. This project is um, taking on 50 to 60 new students a year in terms of homeless. Uh, so please consider a donation to Project Access uh, after the November 18th service. Thanks. Thank you, Dennis. What a great uh, opportunity for us to help uh, kids in this, uh, in this city. Other announcements? Then find somebody you haven't spoken to and tell them, hey.
by your grace, we are running a race. We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Patriarchs and matriarchs, prophets and psalmists, disciples and evangelists, martyrs and saints. We thank you for their example. We praise you for their lives of faith. For all your saints, O oh Lord, who so So one of the reasons that I support this church 
is to continue to allow us to have the tireless services of such energetic and committed and passionate pastors as we have in Paris and Lois. And I challenge you to find your own personal reasons for it. Many of you received your estimates of giving cards and letters in the last couple of days, and, and I'm told that not all envelopes very clearly mark that it's coming from First Congregational Church, so be mindful that it might look like any other solicitation is not. We're asking for your support for what this church does in financial commitments for next year. Give freely, without guilt, or without compulsion. sitting in the 
forth of the guard. In their presence I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts and the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall be again bought in this land. Our second reading is from Luke chapter 6, verses 39 to 49. He also told them a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, Friend, let me take out the speck in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will, clearly, you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, and the evil person out of evil treasure produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you. I will show you what someone who is like who comes to me, hears my words and acts on them. That is one like a man building a house, who dug deeply and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood arose, the river burst again against the house, but could not shake it, because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like the man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the river burst against it, immediately it fell, and great was the ruin of that house. Parents are ready for the day. May the Lord add his blessing and understand hearing, to our understanding and hearing this his holy word.
It's almost over. After Tuesday, the debates and the candidate forums will be history. After Tuesday, the yard signs will be gone, at least the ones that haven't been stolen. <laughs> There won't be any more TV commercials claiming that one politician steals money from nursing homes while another politician bites the heads off kittens. After Tuesday, some of my Facebook friends are going to have absolutely nothing to post anymore. And the news outlets are going to have no excuse for not reporting the really important stories of the day, like the latest antics of the Kardashian Yahoo's. And I'm ready for it to be over. Are you ready for it to be over? Everybody I know is ready for it to be over. Mary Bullock posted on Facebook this week that her husband, Al, is so sick of campaign commercials, he's actually looking forward to pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical ads coming back. <laughs> but I'm right there with him. I mean, the whole thing is so messy, so hateful, so nasty. Not to mention incredibly financially wasteful. Plus, it takes so long. Other democratic countries can have elections that last a few weeks, a few months, at most. I always feel like they last in the next year. No wonder Homer Simpson complained. Why do we have to elect our leaders? I thought that's what we had the Supreme Court for. <laughs> but here's what our discomfort really boils down to. We love to hate our politicians. Isn't that right? We love to hate our politicians. We always have. Years ago, Mark Twain said, there is no distinctively Native American criminal class except Congress. Many years later, a young man came up to Senator Edward Dirksen after he made a campaign speech, and he said, Senator, I wouldn't vote for you if you were St. Peter himself. And Dirksen said, son, if I were St. Peter, you couldn't vote for me because you wouldn't be in my district. <laughs> we love to hate our politicians, and some of us even have biblical support for it. Jesus said in today's reading from Luke 6, that a blind person guide a blind person won't both fall into the pit. And you and I picture folks all over the White House and the congressional chambers wearing dark glasses and carrying white canes and being led around by sea and eye dogs. And then Jesus goes on to say, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its fruit. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil, for it is, for it is the sense to do that. Out of the abundance, the mouth speaks. And we say, aha, there it is. The evidence speaks for itself. The tree is known by its fruit. The politician is known by his or her words of act or words or actions. If the two don't connect to produce good for everybody, and especially good for me, then let's vote the bums out of office. Or even better, let's do like Matthew's gospel and cast them into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> yeah, well, all of that works fine as long as you skip over verses 41 and 42 in today's passage. See, it's a ludicrous image, but it's an unforgettable one, too. Here's a person pointing to the speck of sawdust in one person's eye while he's got a two-by-four protruding out of his own eye. He says, friend, I can take that speck of sawdust out of your eye. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. And he ignores the big hunk of lumber coming out of his eye. We love to deride our elected officials as the epitome of such hypocrisy, but the truth is that image applies to us just as much as it applies to anybody else. All of us have blind spots about ourselves. It's really easy to point out somebody else's sins while ignoring the gaping holes in our own behavior. Elizabeth Byer Bolton, Bolton tells about her grandmother, Nellie, who stockpiled cans of tomatoes and tuna and beans in her basement during the 1950s and 60s. 
And then when, because she was convinced the nuclear war was just around the corner. Then when the sugar shortage came about in the 70s, some of you remember that, she filled up her cupboards with sugar, brown sugar, raw sugar, refined sugar, whatever she could get. And then when the Arab oil embargo came along and gasoline became scarce, she became obsessed with keeping the gas gauge in her old Buick above three quarters of a tank. Every other day, she would wait in long lines at the gas station to fill up again. And finally, her husband would have a snoop full of it, and he said, Gracious, Nellie, do we need to wait in line for gas again? We've got three quarters of a tank. And she said, well, of course we have to wait in line. We have to get that gas before the hoarders do. <laughs> Take the log out of your eye, Nellie. Take the log out of your own eye, Paris. I'll step over a homeless man sleeping on the sidewalk to go to a meeting complain about politicians who don't care about the poor. I'll cut back on my giving to the church while decrying the millions of dollars wasted on political campaigns. I'll fudge a little bit to the cop who pulled me over and tell him why I was going over the speed limit, but it was a really good thing to do. And then go and post on Facebook the latest whopper of a lie said by my favorite politician I love to dislike. The late poet Vislava Simborski wrote a little poem. It was titled, In Praise of Feeling Bad About Yourself. It was written in Polish, but the English translation of it goes like this. The buzzard never says it is to blame. The panther wouldn't know what scruples mean. When the piranha strikes, it feels no shame. If snakes had hands, they'd claim their hands were clean. A jackal doesn't understand remorse. Lions and lice don't waver in their course. Why should they when they know they're right? Though hearts of killer whales may weigh a ton in every other way, they're right. On this third planet of the sun, among the signs of bestiality, a clear conscience is number one. Yes, examine the candidates. But make sure you examine yourself, too. Nobody will ever get it right, including you, including me. So maybe we should cut each other and our elected officials a little slack. But I know, I know, you've got really strong opinions about what needs to be done in this country. You know what ought to happen this coming Tuesday and what ought to happen after that. Guess what? I have the same ideas. I feel just as strongly as you do, though we may not agree. Come Wednesday morning, some of us are going to be really elated, and others of us are going to be really depressed. Some of us will breathe a sigh of relief, and others of us will wring our hands and proclaim the end of civilization as we know it. Well, guess what? The Bible has a different perspective on that, too. Today's passage from Jeremiah takes place at a time when Israel's history of it was at its lowest point. The Babylonian army had laid siege around Jerusalem and it was slowly choking the population to death. Everybody knew that it would be only a matter of time before the city fell. Everybody knew this was the end of the road for them. Even if they survived, their lives as they had known them were about to come to a screeching halt. And then God spoke to Jeremiah. And God said, Your cousin Shalom is going to come and make a real estate deal offer for you. I want you to take him up on that offer. He wants you to buy his field in Anathoth, just a few miles from Jerusalem. So I want you to buy that field. Now, under the circumstances, doesn't that strike you as a bit odd? I mean, the world is about to come to an end for Jeremiah and the rest of the people in Jerusalem, and God wants him to go out and buy a piece of land that will soon be owned by the Babylonians? Sounds a lot like General Custer before the Battle of the Little Bighorn saying to the troops, Men, don't take any prisoners. Doesn't make sense. But to a person, 
person of faith. For a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, it makes perfect sense. Because you see, Jeremiah says, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel says, houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. In other words, it looks like the end. See, if your sights are set on this world, if your sights are set on the systems of this world, if your sights are set on the politicians of this world, if your sights are set on the logic of this world, then what Jeremiah did makes no sense whatsoever. But if your focus is on the God who made this world, the God who sustains this world, the God who is bigger than any election, any politician, any government, or any nation, then it makes no sense for Jeremiah to do anything else than what he did. I love the quote from Martin Luther at the top of today's bulletin. I don't know how many of you noticed it. Luther said, even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. Even though I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, that it would all be over, that the world would end tomorrow, I'd still go out and plant my apple tree. We get so caught up in the world we can see right in front of us or the world we see portrayed on our TV screens that we forget the big picture. We forget that God is in control. Not the Republicans, not the Democrats, not the Independents, not the Tea Party, not the Green Party, not Fox News, not MSNBC. God is in control. So if your candidate doesn't get elected on Tuesday, God is still in control of this world and the next, so who cares? If your candidate does get elected on Tuesday, your candidate still is not in control of this world or the next, so who cares? On this All Saints Sunday, think about what inspired and sustained the saints who made a difference in your life. Was it their political leanings? I doubt it. If they were followers of Jesus, it was their faith that kept them going. It was their faith in a God who transcends any human institution or any apocalyptic scenario. The God who can transform a crucifixion into a resurrection isn't stymied by any loss or any gain or any principality or any power. To this God, even the end is not the end. So after Tuesday, what are you going to do? Even if Wednesday morning looks like the end of the world, I suggest you go out and buy a field in Anathoth. Or at least go out and plant a tree. God has not forgotten you. God will come for you. And ultimately, Nothing else really matters. There's a Presbyterian pastor by the name of Michael in Lingwall. He tells about the time some years ago when he and his son Ben, who was seven years old at the time, went to the New York Auto Show held in the humongous Jacob Javits Center on the west side of Manhattan. They arrived about mid-morning to find the place already packed, wall-to-wall -wall people ogling the new cars and trucks. And for about a half an hour, Linball and Ben had a really great time joining in the fun, examining the sleek vehicles and looking at the odd concept cars. But somewhere around the Ford exhibit, Linball turned around and Ben was not there. He'd lost his son in the crowd. His head began to swim, his stomach churned, he broke into a sweat. He dashed around the exhibit desperately looking for a little blonde boy in that press of clueless humanity. If, it's, if that's ever happened to you, you know the sheer terror that sweeps over you when you scan the crowd and see nothing in Well, Limbaugh expanded his search. He backtracked to exhibits they'd already been to. Nothing. He found the security office and he said, I've lost my son Ben. Could you please announce over the PA system for him to 
meet me at the Ford exhibit. The security officer said, I'm sorry, sir, we don't do that, but let me show you where the Lost Child Center is. It's right down there. So Linval ran down to the Lost Child Center, then one there. Well, now his terror morphed into sheer panic. He went back to the security office, yelled at the guard to make the announcement to no avail. And so Linval began his own systematic search of the cavernous Jacob Javits Center, determined if he had to, to scour all 675,000 square feet of the place. Two horrendous hours later, Linval found his son Ben about 200 feet from where he'd last seen him. He wasn't crying. In fact, he was at the Mercury exhibit listening to a six-foot-tall robot stutter out the praises of the latest model of the Cougar. When Ben saw his dad, he raced to him, and as Lindball swept his son up in his arms, he saw tears trickle down his cheek, and Lindball added his own tears as well. They hugged for a moment, and then Lindball asked, Ben, weren't you afraid? And Ben said, well, a little. And Bob said, what'd you do all this time? And he said, well, I waited here. I knew you'd come for me. And whenever I got scared, I just did this. Well, Lindball was a little flummoxed that Presbyterian preacher's son would pick up the quintessential mark of Roman Catholic piety. <laughs> so he said, where in the world did you learn to do that? And then he said, on TV. And every time I did it, I knew that God was with me. And I didn't need to be afraid. Go blow up to me, if you have it. But as a follower of Jesus, remember this. Your hope is rooted in the God who will come for you. The God who will someday transform the kingdoms of this world into the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you need a little reminder, so you won't be afraid, you could do this. Or better yet, go out and plant a tree.
this morning, we want to continue to remember Alberta and Willis Atkins, the parents of uh, Mary Hartley. Ernie Ludwig continues at Rosewood, having uh, rehab care there. Rhoda Patterson continues at Madam Care, having rehab for a shoulder surgery. Uh, Willie Payne had hip replacement surgery this week, and it's called. Uh, spent two nights in the hospital, and it's just been marvelously well, so we're grateful for that. Emerson Lewis uh, had a procedure to have the screws removed from uh, the surgery she had some time ago, and she's home recuperating uh, well. Um, John Kaufman asked us to pray for Deborah Johnson, whose sister has been uh, admitted to hospice care. Um, Martin Munch was in the early service. Uh, he's doing better, and so we're grateful for that. Uh, Shirley May will have cataract surgery this coming Tuesday, and so Shirley May will keep you in our prayers as well. Um, I think it would be appropriate for us to remember all of the victims of the hurricane and storms and everything that happened this week. Such devastation, and it's going to be a long time before they come back from that. So let's keep them in our prayers. Um, let's also remember uh, our youth as they're away from us this weekend, that they're having a, not only a good time, but um, a time of encountering Christ. And then um, John Kaufman also uh, wants us to know that uh, the infant that we have been praying for, Aiden Andrew Halter, finally came home this week. So uh, we're very grateful for that, and he continues uh, to get better. This, of course, is All Saints Sunday, and during the prayer, I will be calling the names of those saints from this fellowship, from this congregation, who have passed away since All Saints Sunday last year. Uh, and then uh, you'll notice in your bulletin, there's also on the back of uh, the list of our names from the, from the church, there are, there's a list of names of folks that you turned in. Uh, I'll be calling those names uh, and remembering them as well. Uh, and then if you didn't turn in a name, but you have someone uh, whose name you would like to have uh, remembered, please call out, we'll I'll ask you to call out those names as well. So choir, the Lord be with you. The Lord be with you. Let's sing together as we prepare for prayer.
God, there's so many that come into our lives who are not part of this fellowship, but we greet them just the same. And so this morning we remember Joan Chambers and Neil Collins and Dallas Jurgens and Pete Melbourne and Emil Olson and Casero Rotsi, Ronald Phillips, Dave Richmond, Charles E. Skinner, Colleen Smith, Marilyn Linz, and Craig Thompson.
Please be seated. It is now our privilege and our joy to come to the Lord's table. And it is just that. It's the Lord's table, not our table. We're all invited guests. And so no matter who you are, or where you are, or wherever you are in life's journey, no matter what you've done, no matter what you have not done, you are welcome here at this table. For we are all invited guests. Our communion prayer this morning is uh, responsive, and so I would ask you to take your bulletin and join with me. Let us pray. Eternal God, in every age you have raised up men and women to live and die in faith. We confess that we are often indifferent to your will. You call us to proclaim your name, but we are silent. You call us to do what is just, but we remain idle. You call us to live faithfully, but we are afraid. In your mercy, forgive us. Give us courage to follow in your way. Then join with those from ages past who have served you with faith, hope, and love. We may inherit the kingdom you promised in Jesus Christ.
scriptures tell us that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, that he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks again. He said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. Drinking all of it. These, my friends, are the gifts of God for all of the people of God. All. Every last one. Come for all things already.
blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Please join me in a prayer of gratitude. Lord Jesus Christ, you have called us to run with patience, to be faithful through the years, to bring hope to a broken world. Help us each day to be your people and to live lives of uncommon faith and love. You are our Lord forevermore. Amen. shall become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign 